Dr. Phillips is an alumnus in the school class of 64. And I'll let you begin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Father Matt. Well, it's really fun to be here. I haven't had an opportunity to do all this for the last 44 years. That's when I graduated. So um, the reason I'm here is because after raising my kids, uh, coaching soccer with them, club soccer and high school, they all graduated and went away and disappeared. So I had to think of something to do with my life that's important. And I said, well, my hobby's always been the Shroud of Turin as a physician. I'm a physician. I'm in internal medicine, and I'm board certified in allergy and immunology. So that has always been my interest, actually, since 1979. So um, the, the reason I do this is because I want people to know, the youth, the agnostic person, the person who's having a little trouble with their faith, that for the first time in history, I truly believe this as a scientist, not taking my faith and put it aside, okay, scientifically only, that you guys are lucky that you in the 21st century have something that since 2005, just since 2005, is unexplainable by science and has an image and an atheist scientist cannot disagree with the information. And there is some fighting going on between the, the scientists of the shroud and the atheists, but they're not fighting over the details of the scientific parts of the image. So they're fighting on what does that mean? What does this image mean? What's the point of it? Okay, which is all over my head. Father Matt will help you with that. All right, so, so I've been doing this for about two years, and the Diocese of St. Petersburg gave me their blessing, said just stick to science, guys. Uh, doctor, don't talk too much about belief. So I'm not really good on literature and uh, uh, the religious literature and liturgy, but I'm trying to limit everything I'm saying to science. So I'm going to talk about 30 minutes and give you all my background of science. I'm going to skip some of the history because we have a short time. So the history is something I can, you can look on your own. I'll tell you where to go. And then at the end, I want to leave some time. I want to leave 15 minutes at least for any questions you have. I want to answer all your questions. All right? Did I cover that pretty good? Yes. All right. Okay. All right. So we're talking about the 21st century scientific information. I'm going to put it all together in the past, where the science started in the past and where it is in the present. So is this a witness to the resurrection or is it a medieval fraud? Now, the uh, TV people, the Presentations History Channel, they always present something, in my opinion, that's good for about 10 minutes. Then they spend the next 25 minutes confusing everybody. All right, so what's my background? Um, one year ago, September 2011, by geographic accident, um, one of the greatest scientists of the shrouds, sister, living in Safety Harbor, Florida, found out I was giving a talk and told her brother that I exist, because I'm a nobody scientist. Doctors are uh, semi-scientists. And they invited me to join this group. So the scientist called me up, Joe Marino, and he said, would you like to join our group? And I said, of course, I'm honored. So they accepted me. So what does that mean? I'm a communicator. I think that's why they accepted me, communicator, because I'm not a real scientist. Doctors are fake scientists. All right, so what happens then is every day, I am privy to all their email. These are the topest, top 40 scientists in the world presently studying the shroud. And I read their email, and I have sometimes I have to get out my physics book understand what the heck they're saying. So that's what I'm a member of, and this just happened. Then I just passed a one-year internet course from the Vatican, so now I have a diploma in the shroud. So, you know, I'm supposed to know a little more. So those are my recent credentials, all right? Now, back to what we're talking about. <coughs> this cloth is linen. That's very important to know that it's pure, it's not cotton. It has a herringbone weave, just like a herringbone squirt coat. It has an image on it. It's a unique image because there are no other cloths that could be 2,000 years old that have images. This is the only one that has an image. There's lots of Egyptian cloths out there with blood on it, burial cloths, but no image. This is the key. It has blood on it. Of course, blood could be on any cloth, all right? So these are three basic facts. This is a photograph of it. Now, I've enhanced the contrast. It's a little stronger uh, image, a little darker. Actually, it's much fainter and much harder to see. Now in May 2010, I went with my wife and I actually saw it in Turin, Italy, from 15 feet away for about three minutes uh, during an exposition. The next one's about 10 years from now. And when you get up to it very close, within five feet, you can't see the image because it's that subtle. The colors start blending. But as you back up, you can notice the difference in the 
darkness ratio between the background and the image. Okay? All right, so it's 14 feet long, three feet wide. This is at face, chest, arms, knees, back of head, back, legs, okay? And it is as if a cloth was lying down on rocks, a body was placed on it, and then the second half of the cloth was pulled over it, okay? So when the image was created, it has a front back image. Okay, you all got that? All right. Now, this is a close-up. Again, I push the contrast to bring out the image. Now, you need to try to ignore this. These are burn holes. Chambéry, France, it was in a silver case, and probably somebody was trying to destroy it, so the silver case was melting, and the molten silver burned the holes. It was folded up into, uh, in four times. All right, and the burn holes are here. So you kind of want to ignore that. You kind of get your brain hooked on, uh, hooked on the image here. You can see blood in the wrist. You can see water stains where they were throwing water on it to try to put out the fire. And you can see that this man of the shroud, I'm not calling him Jesus, man of the shroud has long hair, mustache and beard, blood spots coming out of the scalp. And on the back, you can see the back of the head. You can see all these marks on his back, which are going to prove to you they're scourge marks all the way down his body and blood on the uh, bottom of his foot. All right, so this, I'm not going to talk too much about history, but I want to give you an idea of what we believe. Obviously, we believe we, it starts in Jerusalem, all right? And we have evidence that someday you can look up that it ended up in Edessa, Turkey, which is Urfa now, from 30 to 944. There's image, um, image and paintings to prove that. Then it was taken to Constantinople. More images, paintings, and um, literature make reference to it. Then we think that by way of Athens, it was in the uh, possession of the Knights Templar after the uh, conquest of Constantinople. And it was in their possession for 150 years. Ended up in Lyre, France. And I have this in white because this is documented history. This is absolute proof. The atheists can't disagree with us. This is conjecture, circumstantial story. So Lyre, France, when it started being shown to the public, Jean Beret, more ex exhibitions and where the fire was, and finally where it is now, Turin, Italy, in 1578. This is the ownership. The king of Italy, the king of Savoy, Italy, owned it until late 1985 when he gave it to the Vatican. Here he is, Pope Paul, um, John Paul II, receiving it. This is what it looks like now when it's not under exposition. It's inside this case, steel case, heavy, heavy glass, bomb proof, and it has argon gas so the material won't de uh, degenerate. And this is the outside of the cathedral in Turin. This is a picture from the exposition. I think that was more like 1978, though. Okay, so let's stick with the science for, for the rest of the talk, but I'll, I'll answer other questions <clears throat> that you might have that are not science as best I can. <clears throat> All right, so physical science starts in 1898 with a photograph. So the first thing that ever happened was a photograph. So, in 1898, they took a photograph. <coughs> Let me get my voice clear. My explanation on this is going to be hard for you to get, I think, because you're too young. You've never taken photographic film into a drugstore, turned it in, and got back prints and negatives. Have you? Do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Like photography class? Even a little bit? All right, well, in the old days, we took film in, and you get prints and you get negatives. If you have a picture of your buddy, the negative would show his body dark and the background light. So that's a photographic negative. But when you make a negative of a negative, the polarity reverses and the positive dark becomes light and the background light becomes dark. All right? So in 1898, the unknowing photographer took a picture of this. He was slightly impressed with the image. All right? His name is Segundo Pia. He got back to the dark room because you had to change the uh, pictures into a negative. And this is what he saw. So you can see now that face jumps out tremendously. It's way more impressive in the, in the negative of the negative. So we now can see mustache. It actually can appreciate rows of teeth. Can you see the rows of teeth? Lower teeth, upper teeth. Sure looks like it, right? Okay. 
This is a forked beard. This is mustache. This is long, kind of fluffy hair. Kind of unusual for somebody that's been sweating and bleeding and, and put through all those uh, tortures. It's, it's like he had a blow dryer. All right? So this is blow dried hair. And these are blood marks all coming out of the scalp. You can see the eyes and the nose and a swelling on the right cheek. So you, can, you do appreciate, you do agree with me, that's much more impressive than the other image, right? Okay. So that was a gigantic thing, and that's all that existed in science until in 1931, somebody took a better photo. And the better photo, when I blow up the front of it, looks like this, in the negative. So again, it's a negative of a negative. Now you can see much more detail because the quality of the photo is much better. Now, what's important is I'm going to tell you what science says how this image was made in the 21st century. I'm going to tell you what we know. Now, who knows if we're right, but it's to our present knowledge. Now, for you to understand that, you've got to first appreciate this man in the shroud doesn't have ears and he doesn't have cheeks. Really important to remember that, okay? His chest is overexpanded. He has blood like not so thick blood, like watery blood coming out of his right side. Now because of the, the imprint and the left right uh, orientation, this is exactly a person you would walk up and shake your hand with. That means this is his right hand, this is his left hand. Okay, so this is, this is a reality orientation of what this person would be if you were to just walk up to him. You can see gravity flow of blood going down his arm. You can see a lot of blood coming out of his wrist. You can see a bloated abdomen. Okay, so this is really the right and really the left. All right? Now, this blood is flowing down his arm. This has been shown by all kinds of pathologists over the, over the many years to be exactly the flow direction of somebody whose hands are like this. All right? So that's totally compatible with the position of blood flow. This is the back of the image. Again, we have blow dried hair and a long ponytail. The ponytail is typical with the Jewish customs at the time. We'll have okay. questions at the end, Griffin. Uh, questions at the end, yeah. And write it down so you don't forget. And then all these scalp bleeding sources and scourge marks, over 120 scourge marks. If you were being scourged as a Jew, you'd get 40. So he was scourged under Roman law, which is unlimited. They, they stopped it at 120, obviously, because they were killed. You can see the long hair. You can see burn holes, which are very important. These, it's like an upside down reversed L, right? All right, so the first thing to refute, which I'm going to get into carbon dating, okay, that says it's medieval. First thing to refute this, there are paintings that exist documented from 150 years prior to the carbon dating age that shows these exact burn holes in the same shape. So the thinking then is that the person that drew the picture must have been looking at the shroud to actually do that. But I'll get into that later if I have time. His knees are pulled up. So he is actually like this. I can't lift both legs. But this is the position. So when he died, he died like this. Head forward, tilted to the right, knees bent, arms up. All right? That's the position this image shows of rigor mortis. You all know what that is. Stiffening of the muscles after a body dies, right? Okay, it comes within an hour or two of death, and it's hastened by somebody who's been tortured. All right, so that's all we know about the shroud for the next 78 years, all right? 20th century science begins, 1976. Okay, so why does it begin? It begins because of NASA. It begins because the science begins because of America. America has evolved scientifically so high that NASA has an image analyzer in its satellites. And what they do is they put this in the satellites and it scans the surface of Mars and the Moon and it looks at the gradations of black and white, um, like the height of a mountain. So the top of the mountain is not quite as dark. As you go down the mountain, the shadow gets stronger. So the computer looks at that difference in color, gradations in color, and it translates it into 10,000 feet, 30,000 feet, so, or, or a 10,000 foot valley, okay? So the image analyzer was used by NASA to look um, at the height of mountains and valleys. So the closer to the image, the darker the effect. Okay, so the image is the same of the shroud. Now let me show you what happens. This is a picture of the shroud. In 1976, Dr. Jackson, U.S. Air Force Academy physics professor, 
put the picture of the shroud, just a normal photograph, natural light, under the image analyzer. And what he got was a 3D picture. Can you appreciate the three-dimensional? The nose is raised up, the uh, swelling in the right cheek, the eyes, the eyebrows, the lips. You can see that's 3D. There is no picture on Earth that you can put under this image analyzer that has a 3D quality. Okay, so encoded into the picture of the shroud that nobody knew until Jackson did it is 3D information. Right. Now that's important to know when we start telling you what, how we think the image showed up on the clock. 3D information. All right. Now this news travels all over the world, and the Vatican uh, hears about it. It says America's pretty darn involved scientifically. We're going to take a big chance. We're going to let them touch it, play with it, do scientific experiments with it, as long as they don't destroy it. So the Vatican gets the courage to allow America to form a team. So in 1978, Shroud of Turin Research Project is formed. Forty scientists from Los Alamos. Ironically, you know what Los Alamos is. That's where we make atomic bombs. Okay, so the people that make giant bombs are the ones that are going to work on the Shroud of Turin. NASA is part of that, U.S. Air Force Academy Jet Propulsion Lab. These are all the disciplines represented by those 40 people. These are all specialists in these areas. All right, so they were allowed to come over to Turin, Italy, work 120 hours nonstop, five days straight, and it was the highest level of science in 1978. Now, even though 1978 is a long time ago to you guys, they were pretty smart then. You know, that's when I went to medical school. We knew something. So I'm going to show you some of the science that the Sturt team found out. All right, first they submitted the shroud image, because this whole thing is about the image. What is the image? Is it paint? You know, is it a burn? What is it? Okay. So they didn't know. And actually, when they all went over there, they all were skeptical, and they all thought the whole thing was a fake. All right? So when they got there, they were a little bit surprised as things gradually dawned on them, okay, that it wasn't that easy a decision. All right, so spectroscopy is the uh, projection of light against material, and the light bounces back, and on the color you get back, you can tell whether it's bouncing off of carbon, sulfur, mercury. It tells you what element it's bouncing off of, okay? Spectroscopy. So under the microscope, they bounce the light off the image. So what are they looking for? Paint, dyes. Uh, graphite, something they, an artist can draw an image, right? That's what they're looking for. And what did they get? All right, they got nothing. There was, there was nothing bouncing off the image that gave a reflection of light, so therefore there were no periodic table elements making up the shroud image. Okay, next. I don't know if you know about x-ray, so let me explain. You can turn up the dial on x-rays. If you turn up x-rays to full power, they won't go through lead. But if you turn them down a lot, way, way weaker, they won't go through blood. So you can, you can actually decide by the power of the x-ray what you want to penetrate. So they turned down powered x-rays at the image of the shroud, and there was nothing stopping the x-ray at all except blood, showing there's nothing on the shroud but blood. No periodic table elements. All right, this is a close-up of the image area. These are the fibers. No dyes or pigments, not a painting. So this is the first time in history that the world knew the image of the shroud is not a painting. All right, now, I'm an allergist, right? So that's the only thing I know a lot of compared to the rest of the world. Okay. Everybody else knows a lot more. But I know a lot about allergy. All right, so what I know a lot about is pollen. All right? So when I first heard about the shroud in 1979, I didn't believe it. I was a complete skeptic. I was taught to be a skeptic by Jesuit, by the way. So Jesuit taught me to be a skeptic. So I said, I have to confront this cloth as a scientist because I don't believe it. I have to get it out of my way in my life. I have to understand what it is. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to have to study parts of the information that I know the most of. So I know the most about pollen. So I started studying the, the, the shroud pollen. And I can tell you, it took me about three months 
but like a chill would wash over me as I knew what I was reading was accurate. All right, let me explain. If you have oak tree pollen and you look under the microscope, you can identify that oak tree pollen in Tampa is different as in its appearance than Atlanta. So you can almost tell their geographic differences. So what you have to do is go to Atlanta and get samples and go to Tampa and get samples and put them side by side. So that's how you identify different species of oak or subspecies, okay? So what, has, what the shroud had on it, and has on it still, are three types of pollen that are only in Jerusalem. These, these plants only in Jerusalem. 14 types are only in Israel. 58 types are from the places we think the shroud was. Istanbul, Constantinople, France, Liray, Chambéry, where we uh, had expositions, and then Earth of Turkey, where Odessa was in the year 30 to 944. Now, one of the most prolific volume of pollen on the whole shroud is a Gondelia teneforti, which is a thorn plant that grows wild in Israel. And chrysanthemum pollen, you know what that is, was also a high level. 29% of the pollen on the shroud is chrysanthemums. So after looking at all this, I in my brain said, how could a guy from the Middle Ages, there was no microscope ever invented, I'm not even sure they knew about pollination and cross-pollination, how did he get samples from Israel, Istanbul, France, and Turkey, go around, ship them over to, the, to, the, to the France, and sprinkle it all over the shroud to fake it up? So I knew that was impossible. Right? So that, that is my first awakening that there's something real scientifically about the shroud. This is another pollen, Zygophyllum dimosum. And it's all in the Sinai, goes all the way up to, up to near Jerusalem. So obviously the wind can blow it. And the pollen that I mentioned all blooms, this is a major coincidence, March and April, which is the time of the Passion and the Passover. All right, so the blooming time corresponds with what we believe happened. All right, now, to digress for a minute, um, when the, when the Sturk scientists got home, they had a bunch of samples of blood, right? And they sent the blood to the University of Texas, uh, Dr. Garza Valdez, and he studied it and found out the blood type was AB, which is rare, 5% of the world population, more common in the Middle East, and another part of blood called MNS markers. You ever heard of that? You probably haven't, okay. That's primate markers, all right? So if you have M and N, you're on the primate system, but only S is humans. So primate, primate, human. So it has S markers on it. So it's not just kangaroo, I mean, it's not just gorilla blood, it is a human being's blood of the AB type. Now this is really important. When the scientists walked into the room and had the shroud looking at it face to face, a lot of them were forensic scientists and they said, this thing's a fake. This blood is red, or more red than it should be. Because all aged blood within a few weeks turns black. All right, so they immediately said it was a fake. So but they didn't find out until a month after they got home what was in the blood, Billy Rubin. Billy Rubin is a breakdown product of broken red blood cells. So if you're scourged and beaten up and tortured, your red blood cells are breaking in your system, in your body. And the, and the breakdown product of the red blood cell is bilirubin, and it's floating around in your circulation, and your remaining red blood cells are sucking up the bilirubin. So it's getting, it's getting more and more higher amounts of bilirubin. And that adds a red color to the blood, all right? But the scientists didn't even know that for almost two months later. Later they found out and identified on each red blood cell the X and Y chromosomes. The DNA was degraded, so they can't really see too much in the DNA. I'm glad because I don't want to hear about cloning Jesus, okay? All right. Now, next part. This is extremely impressive that cannot be faked by a medieval artist. This is the blood that came out of the right side of the chest where supposedly the lance would have gone in. First of all, it's watered down. It's more dilute than just old thick blood. And the most important thing is that a medieval forger would never know this ring, this halo, that goes around it. Because only, it can only be seen when you were applying fluorescent light to the subject. So the medieval ages didn't have fluorescent light. So what this is, is when, when blood dries, the clot shrinks, but what is left is serum. 
So if it stains cloth, the serum line is there, but the blood is retracted away from it. So all this is the serum line in a clot formation when the red blood cells clot together and leave serum, okay? You all had enough biology to know all that, right? Red blood cells and serum. You're seniors, right? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Now, this is a close-up of the blood. You can see it's very red, and it has more bilirubin in it to explain that. All right, now, the biblical accounts. This is what's uncanny. On the shroud are the biblical accounts of the torture of the man of the shroud, all right? But the medieval forger would have had to disagree with what the church believed, all right? And you're going to see how the paintings in the churches, the crucifix in the churches, all the things that the church embraced were not right. They were not accurate scientifically. And I'm going to show you what the shroud shows, how those images were later, well, they're not even being corrected. But this is what the shroud shows. All right, first of all, the crown of thorns was not a crown. It was a cap. Because there was blood leaking all over the top of the head, the sides of the head, the back of the head. So, to have a crown, you've got to have a Roman soldier with his, uh, all his manliness and, and uh, positive testosterone, stop what he's doing, get a thorn plant, weave a little nice crown with basket weaving techniques, and stick it on his head. That did not happen. Those guys were all, you know, brutes, and they just put a hunk of thorn bush on his head, and they smacked it down with a two-by-four. So that's what the shroud shows. So there's no crown of thorns. The pollen of this is all over the shroud. This is a depiction of what it must have looked like, a cap of thorns. All right, the scourging position. The direction of the blow shows, the way they end up on his back, that it was a tall guy and a short guy, and they took turns hitting him with the, with the uh, Roman flavor to cause the scourging. And there are no scourge marks on his hands, up in his arms, and not too much on his lower legs, which makes sense to this position. This is the instrument, the Roman flake, leather with a barbell of steel. And this is his back again, showing a better close-up of all the scourge marks in all the directions. This is a life-size photograph of the negative with the barbell scourge uh, equipment fitting perfectly into the scourge marks. All right, now, the other thing that may disagree with what we have seen in churches is Christ carrying a whole crucifix. It was impossible to do that because he was ready to die from blood loss. There's no way he could even carry it 10 feet. So the evidence of the shroud is that there was marks all across his back, abrasions, that I'm going to show you, where the, where the, uh, horizontal, where the uh, horizontal piece, the pentibulum, was being carried, not the stipes, which is a vertical piece. All right, these are the abrasion marks. These are the scourge marks. You can see how more red and more fullness of color there is here, okay? So the shroud shows evidence of the man in the shroud carrying only the uh, cross piece. Now this is an overwhelming thing that's gonna make every doubter in this room totally not be a doubter, all right? Here's what, here's what happened. Every crucifix, every painting that you ever see has the nail going through the palm of the hand. That is impossible to happen because the weight of the body over the years has been proven by scientists and doctors who have hung cadavers in a cross position and the, the, the nail here breaks right through the soft tissue. It can't hold 80 pounds. The nail had to physically go through the wrist. So, all the images we have in our life of the crucifixion say it went through the palm. That's impossible. The shroud says it went through the wrist. This is the metacarpal bones here, and these are the carpals, and it looks like a very long finger, but it's actually an entire length of bone from here to here. So this is the wrist. There's two directions of bleeding in the wrist, because in the first direction, you're breathing with your lungs empty. So the blood, my hand changed the angle, so the blood's flowing one direction. Then I breathe in, and the blood flow goes at another angle. So this is evidence of bleeding of, of a man who was breathing. Every time you take a breath, it would change position. Now, when you put a nail through the wrist, it bisects and destroys the median nerve. Median nerve controls the motor muscles of the thumb. All right? So if you put a nail in my wrist, my, the motor muscles pull my thumb under into spasm because I now don't have a median nerve. All right? So the shroud shows no 
thumbs. Four fingers, no thumb. Four fingers, no thumb. All right, so medieval forger figured that out too, right? Okay, so that's really impressive that if somebody was faking it, he would, the fake would disagree with what the church says in the medieval times. He'd probably be burned at the stake. All right, so supposedly when the man of the shroud was dead, he put a spear into his side. Now, I have to give you a little explanation about the difference between plasma and serum. We talked about serum when blood clots is exposed to air, it contracts and serum is left. But when you have whole blood in a test tube, not exposed to air, and it sits there an hour, the red blood cells fall to the bottom. All right, they're still in solution. And what's up at the top is plasma, not serum. If you shake it up, it's just, it looks like regular whole blood again, all right? Now this is important when I talk, talk about the, uh, what happened with the shroud, I mean what happened with the man of the shroud and the spear. So the spear goes in right about here, and the first thing it does, it's the pleural space. The pleural space is a, a potential sac that can fill with fluid. So it's, it's a covering over the lungs, but if, the, if you leak blood or fluid out of the lungs, it fills the pleural space, and you get uh, whatever you're getting in that pocket. Now, after that, when a, man, when a person's uh, tortured, there's all kinds of leaking going on of blood into that pleural space. So it's filling up with whole blood. Now, once the person dies and sits there for an hour, or not two hours, all the red blood cells go to the bottom by gravity. All right? So it's kind of like they're subtle at the bottom. Okay. So when a lance goes in through there, it punctures the bottom. So what do you see first? Blood. So the people there, and the Bible says, which actually agrees pretty closely, uh, came forth blood and water. Well, the blood came for, forth first, and the fluid, clear fluid, came out second. All right? Because the shroud agrees with that. And then this is a compilation of all the fluid on his right side and his back that looks watered down that I was pointing to earlier. Okay. The nail in the foot, there was one nail, went right through here between the metatarsals, it didn't break any bones, and the foot was laid left over right. And that's what the shroud shows. This is the bottom of the right foot, the bottom of the left foot. Blood is pouring out onto the shroud from here. The nail was here. All right, so the shroud shows that, one nail. And then in the burial position, I was mentioning the body was in rigor mortis. It was lying on the cloth and pulled over. And that rigor mortis is over about 35, 40 hours later. All right, so at this point, I'm a very happy guy. I'm looking at all the science and saying, man, I really believe this is real. This is really great stuff. It's really helping me. So it won't be such a doubting Thomas. All right, over 100 studies were published and put in peer-reviewed journals. They could have not accepted them. So this is the Sturt Team of America published over 100 studies that I just summarized for you. How are we doing with time? Uh, ten minutes. How much more do you have on this? Side? Ten. Ten minutes. You have a total left of about 15. You got total yeah. for the whole class? Yeah. Oh. All right. So let me talk about this. So. We now know, from also from the Sturt team, that the cloth lying there, whatever happened, created an image not only where it was touching, but where it wasn't touching. So in areas where there's no contact with the body, there's an image of the body. And here is the position of the, of the cloth over the hands, and space is distance between the body and the cloth, and you can see that the body image is darker, there's not as much image, there's not as much information, because the cloth is further away from the body. All right? So whatever made the image had to be distance restricted. That's what we knew up until this date. Until 1260, I mean until the, uh, the carbon dating that happened in 1988 said the shroud was a fake. 1260 to 1390 was the age of the clock. You know what carbon 14 dating is. I guess I don't have time to explain. But anyway, this is what blew everybody's mind, my mind. I went into depression, you know, and this, this is everything I believe is out the window. All the science I thought was right is wrong. So what happened is all the science on the shroud shut down. Nothing was done for 13 years. And all the scientists gave up and did no more studies until this lady right here, a nurse, decided to get some gumption up, requested photographs of the carbon dating sample that was done in 1988, and she started looking at them day after day after day. All right? She is the first one on the planet to notice that this doesn't look like this. This is a sample 
a picture of the sample for carbon dating. Now, don't you think that those white spaces of, look like cotton and bumps and lines is a different dimension than these? This is like a deeper channel. These are closer channel. These are smaller white puffs. These are bigger white puffs. Do you see the difference there? Do you all agree? Because this is critical. Who doesn't agree that that looks different? Everybody agrees it looks different. Okay, well, it's all connected. So they invented the idea, their theory was, there was a patch done. The sample for carbon dating was taken in one place, and this is what got me going again. The sample was taken in one place. They had agreed before that to do six places. So the Italians and scientists at the time of the sample, in 1988, decided he knew more than all the international committees and took one sample in one place. He picked the worst possible place, all right? So the theory then from this nurse, this nurse is this is a medieval patch job that was sampled. He took that information to one of the STIRP scientists and he worked on it for four years and published in Thermochyma Acta, 2005, the following information. Splicing was happening. Cotton was being attached to linen. Original linen, light yellow, cotton dyed yellow, and actually see the dyes on the fiber. So it is believed now and, and proven by this study with four scientists that the carbon dating was done on a patch job, not real shroud linen. All right? So, it's a rush job on what happened. But the bottom line is, C14 labs did the right job because they were given garbage. They, didn't, they weren't flawed in their carbon dating. They just weren't given the right sample. All right? Sample flawed. Reweaving was responsible. So that's what the world of shroud scientists and me believe. So we're revitalized. That's why they're doing all the new studies. All right? Uh, Ohio State University Conference 2008. According to the cloth, according to the image now, here's how the image was created. We think that this is you know, just this theory. All right, so we have no ears and no cheeks. We have uh, blood appearing in hair, and hair doesn't bleed. And we have the teeth, the hair not touching the cheeks. Okay, now, what can do this? The next the, the point to understand then is in the tomb, the cloth was tight around the body, sticking to the sides in the face, blood dripping down the side, all right? So what you have is, it's like you cut yourself, you have bleeding into the cloth, so you have a clot formation, so actually your skin, the clot, and the shirt are all connected. And what happens if you take the shirt off? You rip the clot, right? Okay. They did not have any evidence that any clot was disturbed at all on the shroud. There is no evidence. Every single clot is pristine, outlined, not broken. So the man of the shroud did not stand up and take the shroud off. It would have ripped all the clots, all right? So that's a fact. Fact number one that had to happen. So that's what you got to, when you try to explain something, that's fact number one. Now, underneath the clots, when you look at the fibers, there is no image formation under the clot. So the clot of blood was, was enough that the image formation energy could not go through the clot. So it had to be very weak energy. So it changed the, 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 the uh, threads, the top of the threads all became a little bit yellow from whatever hit them, whatever energy hit them, but it wasn't strong enough to burn the cloth and wasn't strong enough to go through the uh, cloth. All right, now, if this man of the shroud remains wrapped tight in the shroud, you get cylindrical distortion. Because if you can't have a photographic image, you can't have a plate that wraps the image. It has to be a flat plate, right? So for what we know about physics and photography, the cloth had to be flat at the moment of the resurrection, whatever happened. So we're trying to make wild guesses here. So the image is not distorted like it's wrapping a cylinder. It's flat, OK? All right, so this is the appearance, a drawing of what we think happened scientifically. There was an unwrapping of the shroud without moving the clots. It became more or less perpendicular to the body, so it was flat. And then this shows that there was evidence of weightlessness. So there's no compression of muscle tissue on the buttocks or on the legs, so it's weightless. And this is what we think happened in the 21st century shroud scientists. This is a depiction of what happened in a millisecond. The shroud was tightly wrapped. It, some energy made it uh, unwrap, but the body 
had to be entering a different state. Um, it had to be dissolving. It had to be turning into uh, like a plasma, not solid form, or the clot would have been ripped. So in this millisecond of the resurrection, the body was kind of de dematerialized. There was no gravity. The shroud had to unwrap, and the clots had to, to become detached. So what you have is atoms disintegrating, energy release. So the body disappeared. Now you all will be very familiar with this because this is what you see in Star Trek. And I am not kidding. This definitely explains, from what we know of science now, and this image on the cloth, that this is what happened. Now, I don't know if this is Jesus Christ. I can't prove that scientifically. All right? But the body of the shroud disappeared inside the shroud. So reverse EMC equals MC squared, and you make matter turn into energy. That's what you got. And this corona discharge means if all the elements of the uh, atom, we think the electrons could do it. Now, I'm going to stop now and uh, let you answer some questions because the rest is fluff. Go. Yes? How did it determine like, which direction the blood was actually flowing down the arm? Um, which direction? Like, like you said, how it would, well, it would flood, flood with the, um The blood at the wrist is super, super thick on the image. And as it moves closer to the body, it's thinner. So the impression would be the source is here in a large clump, and it's become thinner and thinner and thinner as it rolls down the arm. So they, that's, that's how they think it went this way, rather than this way. Okay. Okay? We have about Come five on. minutes or so if anyone would like to pose some questions. Yeah, me. ask me anything. Don't be embarrassed. Tell me you don't believe any of it. Just uh, anything. Yes. Oh, do they know how like tall the gear on the shroud is? How, how old? How tall? Oh, yes, yeah, so yeah. It's 14 feet long, three foot wide. The man on the shroud is um, 5'11 to 6 feet, and he weighs about 175 pounds. A little bit bigger than me, but 30-some years old. <laughs> Does that fit with body types? Of that yeah, that's, uh, there are people that uh, in the Jewish ages back then that were that big, yeah. That's a little bit bigger than normal. Most of them are like, the, high, the average height is like 5'8", five, 5'9". Is there any evidence of any type of cleaning or any type of care given the body? No, no. Shrouded no, and cleaning? that's a great question. All right. At the time of the burial, remember the Sabbath was coming. Now I'm stepping out of science now, talking like a Christian. And there was not time to bathe the body. All right? They were in a big hurry. Sundown, right? right. They had to do it by sundown. Okay. So in this massive hurry, they just threw the shroud over them. Okay? Now, what's, I think the story then is believed that Sunday morning, the women were bringing spices and they were going to do what they should have done, the, you know, two days before. And they didn't get a chance to do it because there wasn't any body. So that explains the conditions. Yes. Yeah. So they didn't wash and clean the body, no. There's no, like, uh, evidence that I could... No, there's no soap or cleaning material in the shroud's chemistry. Any evidence, like a wiping? No, no, so no. Every clot is, remember, is pristine. Every blood rivulet, every rivulet is perfectly marked. No, no wet cloth has been put through it. That's what's so what, amazing. Yes. Do we know where the actual tomb is? And if we do, has that been studied? Well, before? yeah. If you go to Israel, um, Helen, um, Queen Helen Constantinople's, uh, Constant, Queen, King Constantine's mother, around the year 200, supposedly went back and found the true cross and everything and where it was. And now the whole church of the Holy Sepulchre is built over that. So geographically, it makes sense. Uh, geology, it's a mound of, of uh, marble or granite. It, it, you know, Golgotha goes up about 20, 30 feet. So if you go to the church of the Holy Sepulchre, it all makes sense. But is there scientific proof? No. But on the bottom of his feet, I didn't have time to talk about, is limestone that's in microscopic quantities and that limestone matches the limestone, according to chemistry, of the limestone in that area. No place else. So that's again the forger, you know, figuring all that out that in the future, 2,000 years, we're going to figure out the limestone. No, 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 I didn't know. So I think a true, honest scientist now, if, even if he's an atheist, knows that this shroud image cannot be explained by science. Everything I just told you is what we're guessing, okay? But an atheist scientist has to say, 
I don't know what did the image. It's not a painting, obviously. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Christ. But the image, I have no explanation. That's what an honest scientist would say. Yes. Are there efforts to be made for carbon dating from the other part of the sample? Yeah, there, there is actually, um, the sample was, this, was about this big. Half of it is still in turn, and the authorities there have it under control. Now, their chain of command is gone. It's not videoed. The, the, uh, the doubting people would say they faked it, you know, but they're still, it's still there. So if the Vatican ever gave permission to study that, you would get a date, but, you know, the world would but say it was such planted. an effort made. I remember when that came out, they gave this permission. They were going to allow it to be studied. You know, this is a great breakthrough. Why they wouldn't have gone for prime text. Or, you know, kind of sample. Title. Yeah. Yeah. Why was the sample have any doubt uh, whatsoever? It, well, for t at least 20 years, the two turn scientists were the head honchos of the shroud. They were the scientists of the world. Yeah. All right. All of a sudden, 40 Americans come in, push them out. Yeah. All right. So 10 years go by, they're still in charge. Their nose is out of joint. All right. So when the International Committee spends three years writing up a protocol. I don't want to do it. It's my shroud. I'm the scientist. This is Turin. I'm the head of Turin. I'm going to do it my way. He just made a bad decision on location of sample. Okay. Is there efforts to correct that? Uh, yeah. The, <laughs> the archbishop, who was in charge in 1988, has been fired as of 2010. The new archbishop, this is the good news, is like 50. And his sidekick friend priest that's followed him during his entire life as, as bishop and archbishop is a physicist. So to me, that means the Vatican's thinking this through a little bit and they're putting young, intelligent, scientifically bent people in charge of this route. So there's hope. I might be dead when they finally get around anyway. You gave this brochure. You would have just a moment or two. Would you like to explain it? And how yes, it this is a here? summary of what I believe now about the resurrection, that we now have science to, to almost prove the resurrection happened. It proves it to me. But that's the, that's the, the whole uh, gist of my presentation. And I'm doing them all over parishes and Protestant, Catholic, Rotary clubs. I've been doing it for two years and about 30, 40 presentations. And I'm available to do 30 minute, 45 hour presentations for free. There's no charge for anything. And I am really most interested in your age group because I think when you think this through and study it hard, you're going to go to college, you're going to have your faith pressured, and you're going to be able to drop back and say, hmm, I'm a lucky guy in the 21st century. There's some science that says this cloth could be real. Maybe there's something to it. Maybe I should follow it. Maybe I shouldn't give up on it. So that's why I'm doing this. Thank you very much, Dr. We okay. appreciate your coming.